Well, hey, good morning. Hey, uh, as I said, I mentioned, we are in the middle of a teaching series about group life in the church. It's about finding your inner circle within this wider circle here at Constance. Two weeks ago, Pastor Randy kicked off this series with uh, talking about the need to connect in a circle. And then last week, he shared about the practices that a circle, a small group does together that results in red hot uh, spirituality. Well, this week, we are going to talk about sharing in smaller circles. This is about opening up to one another. Sharing your life with people who you can trust and who are going to care for you. I'm talking about sharing. Now, here's what's crazy to me. We tend to think that this part is optional. We could participate in a group and not really share. Like, we don't need to open up our lives to one another. That we could live a private Christianity in fact, a recent Barna study revealed that 56% of people still think that their spirituality is entirely private. Over half of people think that they do not need to share with other Christians. 56% of us are kind of like this guy. You guys know who this guy is? If you don't, his name is Shrek. He is an ogre. And if you were to meet Shrek when I did in 2001, when his movie came out, you would have found him initially in a one-bedroom cottage on his own private swamp. And Shrek thought that he was just fine being alone. He didn't like to share. Shrek did not like to share his swamp. He didn't like to share his home. And certainly, Shrek did not like to share his feelings. Shrek like to be private. Why? Well, because sharing with other people, it is difficult. It takes some courage. It takes trust. It takes vulnerability. And that's not really like a muscle that we exercise very often. I mean, how many times this week uh, has someone asked you, how's it going? And you just kind of automatically reply, good, how are you? And then they reply, good, how are you as well? Even though you both might have lost your jobs that week. We, it's not like we don't have anything to say. It's just that sharing is difficult. But, but here's what Shrek would tell you. And I know this because he told a talking donkey once. Shrek would say this. He would say, there are more to ogres than you may think. Ogres are like onions. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Now, I'm not calling us ogres here. But like ogres, we are like onions. We have layers. There is a lot to us beneath the surface. And sometimes it's, it's hard to reveal all of the different layers of our lives to people. Have you ever thought about like the different layers of things you could share with people? Uh, when it comes to sharing, I heard a pastor uh, put it that there, are, there tends to be four different layers. Now each layer, we're going to go through them, it's, it's harder to peel back the further you go. But at the same time, with these four layers, when revealed, each one provides us greater opportunity to be loved and be cared for, especially by this circle of Christian friends. And so four layers I want to share with you. The first layer is just simply our experiences. This is kind of surface level sharing. You share about what happened to you. Someone's going to ask you, like, how was your weekend? And then you'll share, well, it was great. I met with my in-laws or I went to a restaurant, you know, um, or uh, what's new? I got a new promotion at work. You know, opening up about your experiences to your circle. This is a great idea. This is really, really good. But there is a layer deeper than this, and this is called, we call it reflections. It's where you share what you feel about the experiences that you had. 
You know, like what emotions were coming up when you, ta- when you learned about your promotion? Probably a mix of like excitement, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, nervousness as well. We share our reflections in groups. Uh, another type of reflection that we share is uh, reflecting about what God has taught us in all this, what we have learned Uh, You know, when we meet with small groups here at Constance, we study the Bible, and a part of our time when we meet together is that we share what God has revealed to us. We're sharing our reflections. But there's a layer even deeper still, and that is we share our struggles. This is when we begin to realize, like, what is going on in our lives. We acknowledge that there's something we're struggling with. It's when we say to the group, like, hey, I I just got to tell you, I got to get something off my chest. There's something really hard going on in my life, and I just want to share it with you. That's a great thing to share, but it gets harder. And yet there's still even one layer deeper that we can share, and that is our failures. You know, this is where we share the things that... um, Areas in our life where we've sinned, you know, uh, places where we've caused some brokenness in our relationships. It's a deep layer. And when our group really gets to know each other and when we trust each other, we can confide in one another. Our, Our circles can be the space where we find help and healing for these deeply broken parts of us. Now, now my guess is you are with me when it comes to sharing your experiences. You're like, yeah, I can share what happened in my life. That's great. Even reflections. You're like, yeah, I could probably get there. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I might have lost you at these bottom two because it's harder to share the further and further we go down. The more layers that we pull back, the more exposed we feel. And you think about an onion, when you pull back all of the layers, what's left? What's well, the core? It's like the deepest part of who we are. And here's why we find it so hard to share these things within our circles, why we're hesitant to reveal our core. It's because that we believe this little old lie. And it goes something like this. We believe this lie that says, If you know all of me, you will want none of me. Like if I peel back the layers and open up myself to you, you are not going to like what you see and you're most likely going to leave. Friends, in this community, in this circle, this should not be. Uh, We have been impacted by a God who knows all of us and still loves us. We can pull back the layers because there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't condemn us for our sin struggles and therefore we should not condemn another when they struggle. Jesus Christ, he went to the cross because of our worst days, because of our dark secrets, because of our shameful struggles. And guess what? He provides us here with a circle of sinners who are also saved by grace in order that we can all find help and healing within community. But here's what happens. Uh, Because we are afraid of disconnection, uh, like if you know all of me, you're not going to want any of me. Because of our fear of disconnection, we end up foregoing any opportunity for real connection. Like because we're afraid of what our circle might think of us if we share, we don't share and therefore we miss out on the opportunity to really connect and grow as Christ followers together. And so what I want to do is I just want to encourage you in your circles, to just simply peel back maybe just one more layer. Like next time you meet with a Christian friend or, or your small group, be open to sharing just a little more of your experiences, 
Or maybe it's another layer of reflection. Maybe open up one layer of struggle or even failure that you're experiencing. Because when you do, you will find that those moments of sharing, they unlock doors to many more areas of spiritual growth, many more areas of deeper intimacy with Jesus, and certainly greater connection with the people around you that you call your family. And so all of this, this is on display, all that we've been talking about is on display in one little story in the book of Acts. And today what we're going to do is we're going to spend our time in Acts, Acts chapter 4, to look at what can happen when a circle comes around people who are willing to share. That's where we're going. Let me set up the story, where we're at before we jump in. Uh, last Sunday, we read Acts chapter 2. This, is, uh, this was about a new Jesus community who is living in a uh, community in Jer- Jerusalem and practicing these rhythms of following Jesus together. And it was awesome. I mean, every day, more and more people were compelled by this community when they saw what was going on, and they began joining that circle and following Jesus. That's Acts 2. Well, in Acts chapter 3, we kind of narrow our focus to Peter and John. These are two of Jesus' original disciples. They witnessed Jesus' sinless life, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven. And in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they are in Jerusalem, and they encounter a man who couldn't walk. And so Peter filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit of God, he looks at this guy and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And guess what? He starts walking. Like, he doesn't just walk. He, he jumps up. Scripture says he jumps. And like, he begins skipping all the way to the Jewish temple, praising God along the way. Well, as he's going, this crowd kind of gathers. They see what's going on. And Peter, again, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he begins to teach this crowd. He begins to tell them about Jesus. He says, hey, it's not by my power that this guy walks, but by the power of Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. Peter starts sharing the gospel. Well, within the crowd, there was this group of people Jewish temple leaders, and they did not like the name of Jesus. In fact, they killed Jesus, and they intended to stomp out Jesus and his followers. So when they hear about a guy talking about Jesus, they know they need to do something about it, and so they arrested Peter and John. They put him in prison, and then the next day, they tried him, but they couldn't prosecute them. So instead, they threatened Peter and John, and then they let them go. Now, we kind of just gloss over this part, like, oh yeah, they were in prison, yada, yada, yada. They were threatened and everything. But like, just think about this for a second. Like, they went to prison. Like, imagine that was you. You just spent the night in prison. Not exactly five-star accommodations. And then you were tried, and then your life was threatened. They said, we will kill you. Like, wouldn't that make you a little stressed? Like, wouldn't you want to just, like, go back home, sleep in your own bed, you know, your own pillow? Wouldn't you like to, like, treat yourself to a personal retreat day? You know, or, like, if you're a little introverted like me, like, just go home and decompress a little bit. Well, you've already guessed, that's not what Peter and John did. I want to show you what they did. We're going to jump into Acts chapter 4, verse 23. It says, on their release, Peter and John, they went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So after this whole experience, after Peter and John struggled, they went back to their circle, their own people, and they shared. They reported what happened. They didn't go and like lick their wounds in isolation. They didn't go uh, into a private place like 56% of people do. They got around their people and they opened up to them. And here's why they did that. 
they knew what I want to tell you about community, that they benefit when they share in circles. Like when we have a group of people that we can trust and lean on in hardships, we gain. We gain so much when we tell people what's going on in our lives. We benefit. In fact, as we walk through the rest of this passage, what we're going to find is the people that Peter and John shared with, they now begin to respond. And as they respond, I found three distinct ways that Peter and John benefited from their sharing. And I want to go through these three benefits with you for two purposes. I mean, really, for those of you here who are like Shrek, you know, might have a hard time opening up, I just want to give you a picture of what could happen when you do share, what you're going to experience, how beneficial it can be. For also, though, for all of us here who are in circles, when somebody shares, I want you to take some notes. Because the way that this community responds is like a playbook on how we can offer care and support when somebody within our circle shares. Okay, so we got three benefits. The first one is this, is that when you share in your circle, you're going to receive prayer. This is the first thing that this community did. Take a look at um, Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 24. When they, when the circle, the people, they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You see, when you open up with a group about what's going on in your life, you can expect prayer. You can expect that a group member would say, thank you for sharing. We care about you. We're concerned about you. And because of that, we are going to pray for you right now. This is exactly what's going on here. This is a community that lifts up our needs to the Lord. And this is a powerful thing. It's powerful in that those prayers actually do something. I want to show you another verse. This is Acts chapter 5, verse 16. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, but it says this. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then it says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person, it's powerful and effective. When the community of faith, of Christ followers, comes together to pray, that has some power to it. And it's effective in that it results in something. It produces something. Let me tell you a little bit of what it produces um, by way of sharing about my own small group. Uh, I've been with my small group, my wife and I, for about three years. And we have this, uh, we've got this text message thread that has been going on for most of that time. And the content of that text message thread is kind of a mix between uh, sarcastic jokes that go towards our group leader, as well as like scheduling conflicts and issues I can't make. You know, that's normal. But if you were to read our text thread, if you were to scroll through it, what you would find are some common texts. They're longer ones, little paragraphs. But it goes like this. It goes, hey, this just happened, dot, 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 dot. Or or, I'm about to do this, dot, 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 dot. Or or, I'm going through a tough time. or, Or I'm sick. And then right after that, if you were to read line after line after line, texts that go like this. I'm praying for you. Send him prayers your way. Or even prayer hand emojis, you know those ones. And then when we gather as a group, we talk and we share and we update those prayer requests. And there have been times when we just stop our conversation right there and say, let's pray. We're going to pray. 
I'll tell you what, our group has been through some tough times. We, we've seen some job transitions. We've seen some family struggles. Within that three years, we've seen health scares, concerns about kids, loved ones who have passed on, tragedies, and yes, even like sin struggles. We know that about each other because we've shared. We've been honest and open, and then we've followed through with prayer. And so to have a core group of people who have committed ourselves to praying for one another, there is power there. It has an effect. Uh, It's effective in that God hears that, and he responds to that. And I, I don't know exactly how God responds, like what's going on in God's mind when a group of people pray, but I do know what happens in my mind Like it makes a difference to me. It results in more encouragement and it changes my perspective of the issue that I'm facing. Look, take a look again at what these people actually prayed. They said, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. That's interesting. They didn't pray about the problem. They prayed about the character of God, that he is sovereign and that he is in control of this situation that Peter and John are experiencing. What they are doing is this, is they are offering a wider perspective. You know, sometimes when we go through something, we tend to just zero in on our problems. You know, the issues, it kind of takes over our thoughts The stress makes us lose sleep. We become a mess. And because of this, the problem just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But when we bring those problems to our group, a group can help each other gain a bigger picture by reminding us of how big our God actually is. Like he's got authority over everything, sea, earth, air, all of it. And then when we remember and refocus on how big our God is in this community, reminding us what happens is that the problems we face become smaller in comparison. And so our very first response when somebody shares, like this community of Acts in in Acts chapter four, should be this. Hey, can we pray for you? Like right now, before we move any further, can we just pray for you? When you do this, you are going to give the person who is sharing a wider perspective, a burdened lift, and a gift. That's number one. That's the first benefit. The second benefit is that you, let's see here, you gain opinions. Wait. Oh. Oh, you gain, no, no, you gain wisdom, right? I got to camp there because we're pretty good at giving opinions, aren't we? Somebody shares something, I think this. Let me just give you a nice gentle warning from Proverbs chapter 18. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Listen, when you share You don't need opinions. Anyone can offer opinions. Fools can offer opinions. But the benefit of sharing in a Christian group is those Christians, these people are connected to something much greater than wisdom. We're connected to to opinions, to wisdom. Now, wisdom is different. It's the Lord who gives wisdom. From his mouth, it comes wisdom and understanding. Wisdom doesn't come from our own infant or finite understanding and from our mouths, but wisdom comes from God's mouth. It comes from God's word. And this is what the group can offer. Godly wisdom found in God's word. And and it's kind of fun because in Acts chapter four, we see this happening too. Take a look at how they responded. They're continuing to pray, but they say this. They now say, God, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, King David. See the colon here? Here comes a quote. He says, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, 
Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided sovereignly beforehand should happen. Here's what's happening in this passage. The group is quoting scripture to Peter and John. They're actually quoting Psalm chapter two. It's an Old Testament prophecy that is foretelling a time when people will conspire together to oppose Jesus the Messiah. And this group is reading this prophecy in Acts chapter four, and they are saying that this scripture passage in Psalm two applies to the situation that Peter and John are going through. Peter and John, they are experiencing opposition from people who conspire against them. They're being threatened not to share their faith. But the Old Testament passage goes this. Those people plot in vain. Therefore, they cannot stop what God is purposed to do through Peter and John. See, this group, they are sharing biblical wisdom. This is the ability to understand Scripture and connect it to our lives in order to apply its principles. They're sharing biblical wisdom. It's, it happens when we take the truth of Scripture and then we apply it to specific situations for godly purposes. This is way bigger than just opinions. When we share in a group, we benefit from that group because that group can connect what we're going through to biblical wisdom. This is ultimately what we need when we share. We don't need opinions. We need wisdom. And so when someone has the courage to peel back a layer, reveal to us a reflection or a struggle or a failure, look, we don't shoot from the hip and give our advice. Rather, we dig into the word and we mine for wisdom. That's what we offer in our circles. And so when you are in a privileged position to be the recipient of someone who is sharing, and when that time comes for you to offer something in return, ask this question. What does God's word have to say about this? Or or simply say, hey, can I share a Bible passage with you that has been helpful to me? Okay, I've, I've got one more benefit to share with you before we close. Uh, summary, we could be encouraged, but share because you could receive prayer. You also gain wisdom. Thirdly, when you share in your circle, you will get restored. Uh, listen, in high school, uh, I had grandparents who lived in Dayton, you know, across the river on some land. And um, in the back of their property, they had this big pole barn. And I didn't go in the pole barn much, but one day I did. And what I found inside the barn was actually pretty surprising. There was inside that barn a vintage, like historic Ford truck. This thing had to be like from the 1940s. However, the truck was in rough shape. It was rusted through, dust all over it, windows cracked, I mean, this thing hadn't been touched in many years. My guess is that uh, for the previous owners who left this thing here, it had been broken down decades ago and was just simply left there in the barn. Now, also, a few years ago, we used to here at Constance hold this uh, carnival on campus, and each year we featured a car show. Now, guys and gals from our church, they would drive their 1940s Ford trucks onto our campus and show them off. And these trucks, they drove, their paint was in pristine condition, they had been restored. Now listen, the difference between the old truck in the barn and the old truck that was driven to our carnival is simply this, people. Like, that's really it. Both trucks were about the same age. 
Both trucks had the same problems. Both trucks had the same tendencies to break down. But the restored truck was surrounded by a circle of people who took the time to invest in it, to work on it, and to care for it, and nurture it back to health. I want to tell you this. Like that barn truck, isolation leads to desolation and ultimately destruction. Like many people suffer unnecessarily in silence and in shame when they struggle, when they have a setback, because they do not bring it before their circle. And like this barn truck, their issues cause them to get stuck and those problems them compound over time. And so yeah, isolation leads to desolation, but guess what's also true? Is that communication leads to restoration. Like we get refilled in community. We can bring our scratches. We can bring our dents, our cracks, our leaks. And there we can find that a community will work on us, will enable us to press on. Our circle can inspire us to just not give up. And they'll help us perform these you know, checkups to keep us on the road to growth. I love how as Peter and John's circle were closing their prayer. They brought this up. Look at, look at verse 29 and 30. They're praying. They say, now, Lord, consider the threats of the people and enable your servants. Enable them to continue to speak your word with great boldness. God, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders like just happened through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Look at this response. They are appealing to God on behalf of Peter and John for further boldness, further courage. They are refueling Peter and John. They're asking God with great expectation to move, continue to work through these two guys. I mean, these are prayers of encouragement. It's like they're saying, God has got something for you. Look, we need this refueling. We need this restoration that comes when we gather with our group and when we share what's going on. We, we need this when it comes to sharing our experiences. We need this refueling when we share our reflections and our struggles. But certainly, and I'd say most importantly, we need this encouragement, this help, this healing as it relates to our failures. And let me camp on this one because it's the hardest thing for us to open up about. Those hardest things are things that we don't like to open up about are the things that we do in secret. You know, like the things we're not proud of, our sin, our failure. Those are the layers we are most hesitant to reveal. But I'm going to tell you something. Sin is like a disease. Even though people might not be able to see it from the surface, when left undealt with, sin is going to spread across your entire lives. And, and though we are forgiven fr through Jesus from the penalty of sin, so many of us are still walking daily under its power. So God gives us a circle. And the hope for re restoration comes through community. Look back at James chapter 5. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. What, what I find interesting here is this, is that we go to God to receive forgiveness, but then Jesus sends us to our circle so that we, we may be healed for healing Sharing is the first step towards healing. Uh, a few months ago, we discovered that my daughter had a toothache. Now, we brushed her teeth regularly. She's five. But what we found out was that we weren't able to get into like the deeper crevices of her teeth. And so her tooth began to pain her. And soon she was having a lot of trouble even eating or drinking. Turns out one of her teeth was starting to erode from within her mouth. And so we took her to the dentist, obviously, and I'll tell you what, she was scared. 
Uh, she did not know what the dentist would do when he found out that there was decay in her teeth. But my brave little girl, she sat in that chair and she opened up her mouth to reveal what was going on inside. And guess what? That dentist was so good to her. He cared for her. He was kind. He said he reassured her. And then he performed the necessary work to heal her tooth. And yeah, it took some time and some visits, but she was healed. She now can eat. She could drink without having this pain in her. But none of that would have happened had she not sat down and opened up. Look, similarly, I've got a group of guys that I meet with. And we sit down on a chair around a table and we open up. We, we open up our lives to one another. We share areas where we've sinned. We confess it to one another. We work on encouraging one another, providing biblical wisdom to each other and giving perspective. And each time we meet, I'll tell you what, I walk away refueled, filled up, restored, renewed. And that's worth it to go and do something kind of hard. Look, I know it's hard for you to share about your life with someone else, but when you take that step to peel back layer by layer, what you will find is that your circle of trusted, caring, godly people, they're gonna be there for you, to pray for you, to provide wisdom for you, and to help restore you. Uh, the end of this story, it goes like this. It's a pretty cool ending in verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And, and I, this is where we camp out in this passage. Like, we love this. Like, God is shaking the walls of the room. He's filling people with the Holy Spirit. Peter and John, they're going back out. More people are going to come to know Jesus. But none of that would have happened had Peter and John simply went home and didn't share what was going on. Instead, they shared in their circle. And that changed things. Listen, you, you want to have a movement of God in your life. You want him to shake the walls of a situation you're facing. You want him to break you free from failure. You want him to rattle your destructive thought patterns and widen your perspective, fill you with a spirit to continue to move on. You want that? The answer is simple. Go to your circle, report what's going on, share so you could receive prayer, so you can gain bit wisdom, and so you can be restored. That's what I have for you. Let's pray about this. Father, we do are, are so grateful that um, there's no condemnation anymore. Now that we have you, we've given our lives to you. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a community too. And though it's hard for us to share what's happening, what's going on, we ask that you would give us the courage and help us to be a people who respond well when people share those deeper layers. Help us to pray well. Help us to provide wisdom. Help us to restore people so that your movement in our lives will be experienced and known. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.